There's one point I must make in connection with this morning, and that is that Confucius never had a computer. <laughs> but there are certain facts involved in the life and teachings of this great scholar uh, that might have influence and significance today. Confucius lived mostly in the 6th century B.C. We know very little about his life except that he is believed to have originated from an aristocratic but impoverished family that suffered from the numerous civil wars which afflicted China. We do not know that Confucius had extensive formal education. It is believed that he was mostly self-taught and attained over a period of some 70 years an understanding of life and of living that was possible only in China. For even in those days, China was a microcosm of the whole world. China's problems and difficulties and complications were miniatures of all others that preceded and followed them. And so that Confucius had an adequate opportunity to understand the basic motivations of human life. As a result of his personal achievements, he was finally elevated to the estate of China's greatest scholar and uh, was deified as the ancient teacher of all the Chinese uh, philosophies and histories. In the course of time, there have been many revivals of Confucianism. These revivals began almost immediately after the death of the great sage. It is said that Confucius died of a broken heart. We are not sure of this, of course, but it is possible, because he said on one occasion that no prince of China would accept him as a counselor. This was something that caused Confucius to realize very definitely that leadership in temporal and, ma and martial affairs uh, usually blunted the mind to those permanent values upon which survival of society depends. In recent years, when China made the great leap into the future, a leap that failed miserably, uh, it was attempting to destroy the influence of Confucius in the life of modern China. It was a dismal disappointment to all concerned, and now by almost complete agreement, the new Chinese government recognizes the contributions of Confucius, not only in philosophy, but in politics, in government, and in international relationships. So from this background of his various achievements, and a study of his various canons, and the various works with which he has been attributed, at least, uh, we le learn something about his ideas of life. China, Confucius, as a Chinese, had a very simple and definite belief, namely that the human being must develop his own resources, that the uh, problem of surrounding the individual with comforts and conveniences and gradually reducing his own interest in self-improvement is fatal to society. Well, we begin to see a little of this fatality floating around at the present time. The individual who lives to do as little as he can and depend upon conveniences for most of the necessities of his life becomes indolent in his own nature, indifferent to his own real needs, and contributes little or nothing to the advancement of his society. This was so basically Confucian that I think we can use some examples out of our own historical background to point up some of the conditions he refers to. The 20th century has been so far the great century of conveniences. The individual has gradually leaned more and more heavily upon society and has leaned very little on his own backbone. Today, we are completely dominated by the comforts which are produced by a decadent society. We are completely dominated by the definite and inevitable desire to be free of all responsibility. 
We want to do as we please, when we please. And the idea of cooperation for a common good has become as dim now as it was in China 2,600 years ago. The same attitudes prevailed, the same problems were faced, and the human being always succumbed to the advantage of innovation and convenience. So in the Confucian Code, we could start, for example, with the result of labor-saving devices. Now, most of these devices are essentially good, but nearly always they are destroyed by cupidity or avagus or avagance or extra extravagance. They are no longer permitted to function as they might have for the general convenience of society. Near the turn of the century, we got the first great convenience, and that is the automobile. Now, no one will say that the automobile basically is bad. And we know that Henry Ford's original Model T, which was a very inexpensive form of locomotion, did open a large world of possibilities. It gave the, the society an opportunity to have adequate means of navigation on the land surface of the earth. But what happened from, from the time of the Model T of Henry Ford to the Rolls Royce of today, a $160,000 car, there's a great interval. A great interval of waste, extravagance, a great interval of unnecessary responsibility an impoverishment of natural resources, and an increasing disdain for the proper use of energy and time. That the Ford car and those that came afterwards did help was certain, but the individual societies into which they came forth abused them until they have become a problem for all of us a problem of freeways so blocked that it's almost impossible to travel them. In the recent earthquake in Mexico, it was impossible to get uh, the fire department and the ambulance the ambulances through the car pressure and confusion. Everywhere, the overdoing of things has resulted in air pollution, water pollution, and the definite waste of natural resources, and an incredible waste of human time, especially when you realize that in the traffic today of employment, cars going on the freeways every morning and evening, the average car has only one passenger. Now Confucius would have said, if you must do it, get together and do it together. That the otherwise, it is a complete waste and loss. Why do we not do it together? Well, one reason may be that one group wants it ten minutes earlier than the other. One wants to go four blocks in one direction, the other one block in another direction. And so the inability to organize this basic needs of transportation has led to many, many difficulties. To say nothing of its application to warfare and its facility in contributing to crime. Now, the use of the car was important. The abuse of it is human nature setting in upon one of its own devices and brutally abusing it. This is what uh, Confucius would declare to represent the lack or failure of the individual to prepare his own inner life for the commodities which he invents or arranges. If the individual was intelligent, every discovery would be useful. But when most persons are not interested in improvement, but are interested only in convenience, it is not long before sins, things are out of hand. And it is also pathetic to realize that humanity is willing to spend a large part of its financial resource on convenience rather than on need necessity or practical usage. So Confucius did not have a computer, but he realized in his own day one simple point. The superior man 
when anything is added to him, will use it wisely. The inferior man will take every commodity and become dissipated about it. He will forget values, he will think only of personal comforts, and he is perfectly willing to wreck the future for the fulfillment of his present desires and appetites. Confucius said this isn't good, and uh, the 2,600 years since Confucius hasn't made it any better. We are still in the same problem, that the individual has the ingeniousness to invent, but not the character necessary to use what he invents. The Chinese themselves invented gunpowder, and they used it for funerals and weddings. Well, that's a comparatively harmless usage. I would have been in Canton when a marriage procession crosses a funeral procession and the fireworks going both ways. <laughs> in other words, the fireworks are cheering up the individuals who are getting married and we are supposed to give them a, a moment of great excitement. And the funerals are to rest the pe in peace the, the memories of the deceased. But these fireworks soon became cannon by hollowing out logs and putting them on the backs of elephants. And uh, these were in actually used by Genghis Khan. Later, we got all over the elephants. We didn't need those any longer. But we kept right on with the gunpowder, which ended the age of chivalry, defeated practically every peaceful hope of humanity and is today a constant danger uh, to security and peace and is being used by various insurgent groups to damage property and destroy life. So something that was innocent at its beginning, that maybe a few farmers also used to blow roots out of their fields so they could plant them, gradually in the hands of ignorant selfishness has become a menace to the survival of humanity. Not too long after all this happened, we had another great uh, invention, the aeroplane. Now everybody really believed we had done something remarkable, and we had. It was a tremendous invention with great potential and great possibility, but we settled down slowly to ruining it, to do with it exactly what we could do to get our own way in things. We do get all kinds of controls. The use of the airplane in war is hardly needs to be mentioned. It has become a carrier of bombs instead of people. Little by little, the airplane has become a great problem to society. The noise is becoming deafening. The corruption of the manufacturers and the mechanics is a constant, uh, constant cause of anxiety, and everything related to it is now done to death. Those who have it need it for some occasions. In, the, in Australia, the physician in the outback can get to his patient in his little airplane. There are all kinds of good uses for that, but little by little, it has become a great factor on the big board and Wall Street, and little by little, it has been turned into a vast source of profit. This is a complete misuse of the original intention, and it has resulted in many changes in society and social relationships that are not good. But we just couldn't get along with something that was a help and a convenience until it became a desperate and difficult situation, as attested by the recent terrible disasters in the air. We have not been willing to use things wisely. When the uh, farmer in Rome found the, bag of the box of gold in his field, he uh, wrote a letter to the emperor and said, What shall I do with it? And the emperor said, use it. The man said, I wrote again, he said, I don't know how to use it. The emperor replied, then abuse it. And this is exactly what has happened all the way along the line. And this was happening in the day of Confucius. And he, has bega he began to recognize that the individual was building around himself such a defense against labor, a defense against integrities, 
a defense against the practical, that he is gradually undermining his own survival in the cause of immediate luxury or success. Now, how had we got the plain thing settled a little bit before the movies came along? And they were to change the history of the world. We were to be on the verge of the greatest educational medium humanity has ever known. We were told that we were uh, going to change the whole history of the race, that we have developed something that can, could be of the greatest value and the greatest importance to the unfoldment of knowledge, to the expanding of human horizons, and a means by which wisdom and understanding could be brought directly into the theater or into human life. I think we hardly need to dilate on this as to what really happened. A comparatively simple and inexpensive medium, which was really a kind of home industry for a long time, gradually bludgeoned into a something that is so terrific that no one can stand the weight of the tremendous power this thing has to destroy peace of mind, represent the basis of international understandings, and destroy the interest of the individual in doing thinking for himself. Most of all, it was to sit all the time watching something instead of trying to perfect or unfold the nature with which we have been endowed. Well, the motion picture got into many difficulties, especially after the Hayes office was broken up. But it finally came to television to really bring the whole thing directly to us. Here was another great invention that was to bring marvelous wealth of insights and understanding to humanity. And we all know what happened. That for the most part, it has gradually been exploited into nothing but a visual form of entertainment and a waste of time. So all these great inventions are the similar to the story of Muhammad, who on one occasion said of a great discovery that had been made, that the mountain had given birth to a mouse. The things that we thought were going to do great and wonderful things were no good, because we abused them. They could have been wonderful, but just we wouldn't let them be wonderful. We would not allow anything to happen for the good of all concerned. And so we are not only deluged with uh, miscellaneous entertainment, but the whole media has been so corrupted by commercialism that more, mostly the ads are more interesting than the major features. <laughs> so we go on. And then uh, the last one. We come to the splitting of the atom. This was the newest discovery. This was the gift of science to the ages. And you see what it has done for us and to us. It has brought the whole humanity into a state of continuous nervous shock. It has destroyed the securities. It has corrupted moralities and has given us a, birth, a birthright of death and destruction. But all these things started out as fascinating, delightful ways of adding to human knowledge and comfort and convenience and protection. But before they reached their zenith, they destroyed the very ends which they were intended to support. Now Confucius has the answer to this, and a very simple answer which we can all consider, that the primary purpose of the human being in this world is to improve himself. He is here to grow and not to become ever more dependent upon society to support him. He is here to learn to stand on his own feet, think his own thoughts, defend his own principles, and unite with others for the advancement of the common good. In other words, Confucius did point out that mankind is a socialized structure. The human being is a creature who needs companionship, needs association, and needs insights and courage and character to carry on the unfoldment of his own life. Little by little, the things we have surrounded ourselves with have destroyed the interest of the individual in his own self-improvement. 
Uh, I noticed in the Taiwan news a few days ago uh, that a Buddhist bishop has retired from being the head of one of the first Buddhist temples in Taiwan. He was subject to some comp uh, uh, criticism, however, because he was introducing computers into the temple. Well, maybe they belong there, but not the way they're generally used. Little by little, we are taking another device, and we are gradually going to use it until we try to substitute a machine for common sense, for integrities, and most of all, for growth. We are not interested, really, in improving ourselves. Our mathematics may not be much better than in the time of Confucius, who, however, was a wise man with the abacus. An abacus, by the way, is an adding machine, multiplying machine, and dividing machine that has never been excelled. And in the banks in Hong Kong, they put them against the electric um, adding machines, and the uh, abacus won in every test. This uh, was because of one thing that would have tickled dear old Confucius very much. It takes ten years to learn the abacus. Now, in other words, by the time you learn the abacus, you had some self-discipline, you have got, gained certain intelligence, you have learned principles and facts that make it possible for you to operate this little device very beautifully. Incidentally, the abacus is available in Hong Kong but at very reasonable prices, some simple models being only one dollar. And with this, you can add 15 figures to 15 figures or multiply 15 figures by 15 different figures and come up with the answer in a matter of seconds. This is because of your training, not the training simply of a machine that thinks for you. All devices that think for you are open to suspicion according to the Confucian mind. We are not supposed to get substitutes for thinking. We are supposed to develop simplified forms of living that free us for the essential purpose of our own humanity. We are here because it is necessary for us to grow. And when we block this growth with every convenient and commodity you can think of, and finally complicate it with alcohol and narcotics, our purpose here is completely frustrated. The individual passes from the cradle to the grave as a complete loss to himself and a loss to society. There seems to be no reason at the present moment. Now, uh, Confucius was also a, a bit of a philosopher in his own way. He was a great defender of ethics. He believed that the ethical system was the most important of all. He was also, strangely enough, not a religious man in the obvious sense of the word. He venerated his ancestors, which was a Chinese custom. But most of all, his religion consisted in the development of character. Wherever there is a deity anywhere in space, wherever the universal laws govern things, their greatest accomplishment is to find honest people, to find those who can use new ideas constructively and will take the potential resources of the universe as they know it, and our world particularly, use them carefully, conserve them, realize the importance of understanding them, and perfect ourselves in the skills and courage uh, to make this world an orderly place in which to live. Now, Confucius felt that the more we are deflected from this essential purpose, uh, by ingenuity or luxury, we are destroying ourselves and that in so doing, we are turning our world into an unsafe place, that we are endangering the integrities to support the selfishness and acquisitiveness of human beings. Man is not here to accumulate material possessions. He is here to stimulate and unfold the internal resources of himself. Therefore, the ideal of Confucius is set in the concept of the superior man. Now, what is a superior person? 
Well, Confucius gave a very simple answer to it and probably lived it as closely as any human being could. He said that a superior person is one who is above doing inferior things. In other words, a superior person will not compromise integrities, will not lower himself to abuses of privileges, and will not allow himself to develop habits that are detrimental to his own life or to the community in which he lives. The superior person is one who is above inferior actions. Now, inferior actions all root in one ethical concept. Nearly always inferiority is an effort of that which is unworthy to achieve what it does not deserve, or it is the effort to create unworthiness as the norm and demand it of all human beings. Instead of rising to the higher, the individual tries to drag his society down to his own level. In doing so, he is no longer a superior person. Confucius also pointed out that the superior person finds it important and valuable to simplify his life. A complicated life is a wasted life in most cases. Unless these complications are extraordinary dedications, complication is merely a waste of energy, a waste of time, and a loss of the opportunities, privileges of human existence. So Confucius believed in being simple on the outside and thoughtful on the inside. He believed that the individual's primary need in life was to so simplify his conduct and his possessions that he had time enough to grow and that growth was improvement and growth was the acceptance of learning of some kind that was valuable. Now Confucius recognized two forms of learning, secular and that which is superior to the secular. He recognized the fact that some learning must be used to give us a livelihood in this world. He was fully aware of the need of the apprenticeship system. He knew that young people had to be educated to carry on the problems of daily living. And by gradually involving a skill or a proficiency in the curriculum, they were prepared to face the vicissitudes of physical, of physical confusion. But uh, Confucius said there was another level also on this particular problem, and that is the preparation that education must bestow to prepare the individual to correct the inferiorities and infirmities of his own nature. Half of education helps to make him a living and a profession or a trade. The other half of education must be dedicated to the release of the highest possible powers within the individual. Even in his day, Confucius realized that the great the examinations of the classics held in China, in Peking and Xi'an, that these uh, examinations were more or less intellectual. They indicated familiarity with the classics, an understanding of the rules and proprieties and of daily living and things of this nature. But Confucius found them deficient in a great many points of importance. In other words, Confucius believed that an education must include the development of an internal strength and an acceptance of responsibility for conduct. The individual who does something must be able to stand the consequences of his own action. If he decides to commit a crime, he must be willing to face the punishment. If he is not able to integrate his own personality, he will live below the level of the superior man. The superior man in the Confucian conduct is so simplified within himself that there is no place in his life for grudges. No place for antagonisms and intolerances. No place for orthodox fanaticisms. No place for any negative action. Anger, hate, fear. These are the attributes of an inferior person. Because an inferior person does not understand why these negative situations 
are in existence or necessary. And he doesn't realize that they are necessary only because he has created them. So the uh, Confucian must become, what we might say, a gentleman. And uh, there is no doubt in the world that in the Chinese code, whoever was a Mrs. Confucius had the same responsibilities. In the Chinese philosophy of life, uh, the uh, responsibilities of the family were divided among all generations that existed together. Uh, the, he did not consider the fact that the head of the family had to have a dogmatic or critical or cruel code of conduct because he was one of the first to point out that whatever we do to others should be the same that we would have them do to us. One of the 40 different religions and philosophies that stated the golden rule was Confucianism. Confucius said, never do to anyone else what you would not have them do to you. Now, this brings together a whole group of factors. Supposing we are cheated, supposing we are deceived, supposing we get into all these difficulties. Well, I think Confucius would first say, why are you in these troubles? What was the ignorance in yourself that got you into them in the first place? Did you do something that was unwise? If you are unwise in something that you did, why are you unwise? Well, probably because education, environment, or the circumstances of living did not give you the wisdom to handle the situation more skillfully. All difficult experiences are tests of growth in which the individual finds ways of improving his own conduct. If, if nothing else is possible, then the individual has to face the payment of the debt which he has contracted. He must meet it with firmness and courage and kindness and gentleness. He must in every way possible avoid collision of opinions. He, he may feel that his opinion is better than somebody else's. But if it is truly better, all constructive opinion must have solutional factors. In other words, when we criticize something, we should know what to do in its place, how to correct it, or how to solve whatever the problem may be. Therefore, he summarized it all in the thought, a very simple thought, that when you tear down, you must have something to put in its place that is better. Just to go raving down the countryside, or through your own home, tearing things down with no remedy is not a symptom of a superior person. A superior person is always in control of themselves. In life and in death, they face realities with composure, integrity, and peace. Now, uh, Confucius did not deny the, a, a divine power or a deity. But he considered that whatever that deity was, was in a strange sense its own affairs. That man is so remotely removed from this great superior pre uh, presence that all he can do in his own person is to live the rules that that superior power has, has created. This superior power has given us the laws of nature. It has given us almost all of the essential convictions of our own security. It has made it possible for us to increase in skills and in genius. It makes it possible for us to have friendships, affections, regards, and many different pleasant and constructive circumstances. Confucius was quite certain, however, that you can't simply take something out of the human mind and leave a vacuum. You cannot say to the individual, don't worry, unless you can give him something to use his mind for that is better than a worry. You can't say that he should break an evil habit unless he is given an, a vision of a good habit, of a thing to be done right. We don't tear down unless we can rebuild. And Confucius was very much of that mind. Therefore, that the superior person is constantly seeking to find constructive solutions to mysteries, to situations that are difficult, or to find the common sense in those things which appear to be accidents of nature. Confucius was therefore also given to literature. 
He believed that the quietude and peace of the superior man is sustained partly by an inner contentment. That there is food for the body, he admits. And he also tells us in one of his writings that he slept in a wool nightshirt that was two feet longer than he was. This was, of course, a critical and vital fact, but it was important to him. But Confucius also was a poet. He loved to read good poetry. He liked to study the classics. He liked to, he liked to know what other people were thinking. He was able to sit quietly and listen happily to people who disagreed with him. He did not demand a private universe ruled over by his own convictions. What he was trying to do was to build within himself a character strong enough to face the truth without flinching. And when he found or came very close to being in that condition, he, he discovered that when you face the truth, there is really no need to flinch. It is not something desperate and difficult. It is simply something that individual has, has ignored in order to live less than he needed to live. The, uh, the better life is not something that is a great hardship upon character or time or energy. It is really the simplification of all things. What, of course, if you simplify the life of the average person today and take away from him everything he doesn't need, there's not really much left for him. He is practically bankrupt as far as values are concerned. The only thing that is keeping him alive is his, is his own mistake, whatever it may be. He is struggling from one day to another through the difficulties he has set up for himself. Well, in some cases it seems impossible for it to be otherwise. He's not going to get rid of the difficulties always, because the difficulties arise around him as well as within him. But the way he reacts to difficulty is always a private property of his own. He is able to do that which he is strong enough and wise enough to do. And the uh, ethical side of his uh, lives was to Confucius a balance of philosophy and common sense. Of all the philosophers of antiquity, he was probably the most realistic. He was the one who was not given to, to strange visions or distant beliefs. He believed in a world in which there was work to do when somebody had to do it. And unless people began to do the work better, the world was going to get worse. Now, he was more or less justified because in the 2,600 years since he was with us, the world has been in pretty poor shape most of the time. In other words, as one wise person remarked, history as we know it is very largely a long drawn out story of human failure. The uh, good things uh, were minimized. The, great, the truly great people were martyred, forgotten, or ridiculed. And the world went right along making the same mistakes from the time it first threw a rock at someone until the day when he now wants to throw a rocket at them. It's the same thing. We haven't gotten down to facts. And yet within the human being, there are powers that are great enough to solve these problems. The human being who could invent a computer could also have an understanding of its proper use. As long as he can see the computer as an instrument of public service is one thing. But the moment this instrument passes its skills and its mechanical advantages, to the unenlightened and the uninformed, uh, to the honorable and the dishonorable, the thing, the computer begins to react savagely upon its own inventors. It permits a more convenient way of being wrong. It gives the individual further opportunity to advance his own selfishness, to use the computer to the advancement of the crime, crime in, uh, empire that we now live in. So no one can afford to invent unless he has some way of assuring that, that the invention will be properly used. Now we don't know what will be next invention, but it will be another one, and we will do the same thing with it. We will think of it largely in terms of how many million dollars the profit it will make. 
and we also will think of it to some degree on how much it will satisfy unnecessary attitudes of our own. It will get us somewhere quicker, but we won't be any better when we get there. It will enable us to avoid or evade certain forms of education, which, however, only means we are less educated than we were before. A computer cannot educate us. The individual has to educate himself. He has to use the efforts of his own inner life. No matter what device man invents to the end of time, there will never be a device more extraordinary than himself. There will never be a form in nature, artificially created, that can equal man's natural birthright. His natural values, his natural insights, and his potentials for achievement. The human being is an absolutely universal creature. Everything that man has ever thought of or known has come through his humanity. The great art, the great music, the great literature, the world religions, philosophy, science, ethics, morality, all these things arose from a mysterious little complex in the human head. And there is no limit to what can come out of the individual if he can train it and will dedicate it to right use. If, however, the individual does not use wisely that, what, that which comes out of his head, in a short time he will perish and the achievements that he has made will go back into the earth with him. Everything that man learns gives him a new insight into value. Now, young people today are bankrupt for value. They are surrounded by selfishness. They are part of a system of high exploitation. And every direction that the individual looks, there is some kind of corruption or shortcoming. This makes it very difficult for the individual to really achieve to the integrities that are necessary. In another strange way, this was true in the days of Confucius. He lived in a world that was full of antagonisms and petty ambitions. China was not a country or a nation at that time. It was a mass of little feudal principalities ruled over by despots and tyrants who loved to take over their neighbor's property and murder anyone who tried to interfere. It was a time of war, strife, sedition, corruption. Yet with it all, it produced two great persons who were contemporaries, Lao Tzu and Confucius. There's a story that they, they met, but this may be apocryphal. We're not absolutely sure about it. Confucius admitted that he could never understand the strange, vague spirits that moved in the clouds in behind Lao Tzu. To him, Lao Tzu was a mystery, unsolvable. On the other hand, Lao Tzu, facing Confucius, found in him a level of insights or understandings which were incapable of gaining the insight that Lao Tse himself believed to be necessary. In the end, Lao Tse is pictured with riding on a water buffalo off into the Gobi Desert because there was nobody that wanted what he had. And the last words of Confucius were, I have failed. So this is what happened 25 centuries ago. And this is the thing that happens today when anyone tries to break through uh, this armament that uh, has been developed around a success syndrome, a belief that what we are doing is so magnificent, so wonderful, and so remarkable that if we perish doing it, it's all worthwhile. <laughs> this is a uh, a little uh, kind of sad to think about, but it is definitely there. At one time, Plato also wanted to uh, reform the Athenian state. He had the background of family that he could be an archon or an elder of Athens. He tried it and retired immediately on the grounds that it was impossible for him to accomplish the good necessary to make the Athenian state a better and more honorable place. Therefore, he retired into the academy and lived there for the rest of his life, creating a little empire of his own in which his disciples began, began to understand what he was trying to accomplish. So uh, Confucius, in his way, was one of those 
who, uh, to borrow the words of President Woodrow Wilson, who said it was better to, to fail in a cause that must sometimes succeed than succeed in a cause that must certainly fail. Today we are all in this problem. It is better to do the thing as right as we can do it, knowing that in the end right triumphs, and that every step that is taken in the right direction becomes part of man's heritage of wisdom. And there have been many very great dedicated hearts and minds that have given us wonderful insights and wonderful instruction. But most of these we don't pay any attention to. Our reading now is usually in sensational paperbacks. It is punctuated here and there by a new idea. Some of those ideas are good and some only complicate the situation. But anyway, the human being, quietly, has to recognize that none of these things need to move him. He does not need to be wrong because being wrong is fashionable. He doesn't need to remain ignorant because wisdom looks like a responsibility. He does not need to neglect his inner life in the desperate order, offer a tr effort to become physically opulent and successful. How we got the way we have is difficult to imagine because the truth of the thing is so obvious. And of course the simple answer to the whole business is that success for most persons has to end at the grave. All the things we have piled up here we simply leave to our relatives or our descendants to haggle over. We cannot take with us anything except, if something, what we have achieved internally. We are supposed by nature to leave this world a little wiser and a little better than when we came in. If this is a failure, if we do not know more on our deathbed than we did in the cradle, then we have failed. And that is the problem. In fact, it's worse, because in the, when we were children, we only knew or were only ignorant, simple ignorance. Whereas as we get older, to follow the Confucian adage, we come to the time when we know not and know not that we know not. Instead of being simply ignorant, we become compoundly ignorant. <laughs> that is, we have reached the point where we not only do not know the truth, but have accepted so many things that are untrue that it's almost impossible to extricate our mind from the dilemma. So actually, the problem of making something out of life is not as difficult, dangerous, or terrible as we might think. It is simply a matter of building internal value. Now, at the beginning, it will probably be a bit sketchy. We're not going to start in by being stupendously enlightened. But we are going to gradually begin to recognize, as Buddha did, that the first step is difficult. But if you take it wisely, it justifies all the other steps. The first step is the difficult one. Because it means that we step from a condition of compound ignorance to the beginning of a search for wisdom. In the first step, we may fall on our face. Quite possible. Because we don't know where we're going. But first step is dedication. It is a determination to be better. It tells us firmly that we are not living our own potential. The first step is to realize that there is something better inside of us than we have ever permitted to come out on the outside. That there is more inside of us than we'll ever find on the outside. And that the treasures of the inner life have an endurance, whereas the treasures of the outer life, if they are physical, will be taxed to death. And if they are not physical and taxable, we must leave them at the grave. So all these different problems brought out the concept that Confucius had of what might be termed a good average person. His superior man was not something that walks around on high boots and lords it over others. His superior man is not one that is loaded down with credentials. His superior man is not one who is too good to mingle with anyone else. His superior man is simply an individual who has found his own center and is going to try to live according to it. 
And in so doing, he has also solved the problem of his relationships with other people. The superior person is not one who lords it over others. He is the most humble and simple of all people because he has a depth of values which enable him to understand the mistakes of everyone except himself. Though he has his own mistakes, he has to struggle through. But these mistakes of others he can philosophize upon with considerable ability and with constructive results. Confucian is not having had a computer to work with. We now find what is happening. It used to be that we taught children the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. In those days we spelt arithmetic with an R. Uh, these uh, simple facts were very awesome when you started out. Uh, the multiplication table looked desperate at first, but it gradually took common shape, and first, you know, we were able to add up grocery bills with comparative convenience. Little by little, education taught us things. It taught us to learn certain things. An education in contact with other people brought out certain points that were valuable. But now, if we allow computerization to do our thinking for us, to enable us to solve all the problems of higher mathematics, for instance, because we know nothing about them ourselves, but the computer can give us the answers, we are going to have a new kind of ignorance, an ignorance based upon the misbelief that a mechanical device can think and has proper moral integrities. The problem of the computer will be its lack of morals, and without its morals it can be an instrument of destruction. We are already overtaxing the values of it. Already we are obsoleting model after model and selling them off for 10% of what they cost. Anything for a quick profit. There's no really a quick profit in the computer than any other factor. All values have to be slowly and carefully earned. The individual has to feel the weight of responsibility to grow, to mature his values, and to become a thoughtful person. In other words, as Confucius would have put it, he had to put an iron control upon himself. Now, at first, a control seems a terrible thing, so the individual has never had any. It's like trying to break in a horse. The horse is going to be very difficult at first, and the individual's inner life, his mind and emotions, are an unbridled horse, which he has been feeding for a long time and patting occasionally, but has done nothing to discipline or prepare for useful futures. So we all have to find some way to get at this thing and, of course, Confucius had his ideas of how this was to be done also. One thing he observed or remarked clearly was that it was necessary to use the sensory perceptions not as instruments of pleasure, but as instruments of information. In other words, your eyes are to look for things worth seeing. Your ears are to listen to things worth hearing. But if you use your eyes only to amuse yourself, or you use your hearing only uh, to listen to rock music, you're liable to have difficulties. All these sensory perceptions must be used constructively to tell us things. They must tell us when we make a mistake. They must tell us when we have overdone something or neglected something. These faculties are there to make bridges between our own minds and the natural world around us, which has principles and truths that we need to understand. So we simply use these faculties not to surfeit them, not to indulge them, not to fall into a sort of intoxication of the mind, but to strip it of its superficial um, addictions and not like it into a very definite program of purpose growth. This we have to do, or else we will go out of this world as we came in. And that is really too bad, because it's, and according to Buddhist philosophy, it merely means we come back with a heavier load of karma than we should. We should be paying karma, not making it. 
We should be getting over the sins of the past rather than trying to carry them joyously into the sins of the future. We need to understand life. Now, Confucius was not a dour character. He wasn't one of those old wise men who looked very difficult to know or understand or contact. He apparently had a wonderful sense of humor. And he was also given to divination and things like that. He wrote an elaborate commentary on the I Ching, which was one of the best that was ever written and is still included in most of the Chinese texts. He was interested in everything. And he also had an, a, realize, a realization that the sciences were instruments of divination. Even reading, writing, and arithmetic have a magic in them. The magic of what they do to the mind, helping to strengthen it and, and develop it. The individual who does not care about developing the mind is going to have sickness, he's going to have broken homes, he's going to lose his job, or stay on a very mediocre level as long as he lives. And now in Switzerland, for example, the uh, t Tibetan um, uh, people who have been thrown or cast out of Tibet or have escaped as best they could are now fitting themselves into the life of Switzerland and are doing an extraordinary job of it. The young Tibetan children are now attending uh, Swiss schools. And according to records published recently, most of those Tibetan children, although they came from another land and have had to learn a language, most of those children are at the head of their classes at this time. Why? Because their ancestry taught them that to learn is a privilege. Their background warned them of the importance of developing disciplines and strengths and to adjust to realities and to prepare to live in a, in a constructive manner in a strange world that far from the one they've left behind. It was simply a matter of these young people having brought from Tibet with them an integrity which has not yet been destroyed. An integrity which makes a new reason for what they're doing. They are grateful for the chance of learning. Most of our people have a tendency to resent the responsibilities of learning. To them it is a bondage, and many of them feel that that is justified because the type of learning they're get, getting is not what they want. Well, there are two sides to that coin. One is that they're probably right in much, many, many of their conclusions. They're not getting the education that they should get. But on the other hand, they are getting an education such as it is, much of which they need, regardless of its ineffectiveness. To reject the education we have does not mean that they have found a better one, and there's where the problem is. It means simply that they renounce education per se. They just walk out of school and become dropouts. If some of them are geniuses, they will win anyway, because you can't stop the mind that has already begun to think. But for most cases, if they have damaged themselves. Whereas if they had at least a good, psych, a good grammar school and high school education, they would have trained the mind into some kind of discipline, if it was only memory. They have put some responsibility upon their own thinking. They've had to give up a few, a few foolish notions in a desperate effort to make an education support them. This is something. It is not perfect. It is not right. But it is what we have. But these same young people who have gone through this kind of discipline are ready for other discipline. And they can do what most wise people have found, namely that education really begins after you have graduated from school. Until then, you are limited by traditional superstitions for the mores that you cannot do much about. Confucius, therefore, gave us the model of what he calls the right kind of person. This right kind of person is, is a homebody. The world begins in the human home. And according to Confucius, all of the relationships of life expand from family. The home is the one little island of integrities that can be established with some success by persons who are simply dedicated to kindness or uh, understanding. The home becomes the, the basis of all knowledge. 
The home is made up sometimes of three or four generations, but all of these have their common understandings. Each one has its proprieties and its properties. The, you see, the heads of the family will not badger the younger ones simply because they have authority, and the younger ones will not badger their elders because they do not like to be badgered in their turn. Everything is upon proper dignities. Every courtesy of life should be in the home. Confucius was bitterly opposed to the idea of behaving yourself in public and doing what you please in private. He didn't consider that a very good way of life. But upon the basis of the home comes the training of the children, and the child's mind is set by the time it is eight or ten years old. By that time, children divide into two groups. One group composed of those who want to get out of the home as quick as possible and do not care what happens to them, and the others who have been inspired to improve their lives and either to emulate the virtues of their ancestry or else stand firm against the vices of those around them. So the child becomes the basis of the empire. The neglect of the child is the most desperate evil in the world, according to Confucius. He said that where we do not give the children the proper background, we are, we are crippling the adult. The ruts we set in the mind by our own attitudes and the, and the false opinions which are set there in very early life are almost impossible to eradicate. There are gullies and valleys and cliffs and precipices in the mental structure which become a detriment to all constructive thinking. So, and after the beginning of it, so says Confucius, the family has also a worship. A worship is a kind of respect. To Confucius, veneration is respect, and it has to be earned. And it is the privilege and right of every individual to be respected, but he has to deserve it. So Confucius pointed out very definitely that in the home, every dignity, every propriety, every integrity that we would like to see applied to society is being cultivated and practiced. That the home is not a place in where evils are practiced in secret, but where virtues are practiced both secretly and publicly. So the home is very, very important. An intelligent home is the strongest factor in the survival of a nation or a civilization. After the uh, strength and value of the home comes the next level, and that is the recognition that we are all here to have certain relationships with society around us, that the home has to expand. The town becomes the home. The city becomes the home. And each individual, in his own way, must try to be a good citizen as he was a good member of his own family. All units of culture are families, and all families are made up of persons who live in respectful relationship with others. Every courtesy and dignity of life is practiced first in the home and then in society. And in everything that happens, integrities are rewarded, and we do business with those who are honest, and not those who sell it a little cheaper. We are trying constantly to perform the ethics and integrities which make society possible. And from there on, we have duties to perform. We had the Hindus brought over into China certain concepts of duty, and these were taken in by Confucius, Manchus, and Lao Tzu. These duties are the duty of the family and the householder. The individual who has been raised and lovingly cared for in a good home has a moral duty to become a parent in his own turn. It is not uh, the idea that uh, the child uh, must always be grateful to the parent. It is that the parent must in turn become a parent. The child cannot pay the parent, but society can. And all these different values become very, very important in society. So that uh, 
if the individual was given a childhood and a loving care and when it was helpless was helped through emergencies when that individual grows to maturity he has his own family and in that he pays his debt he pays it not to those above him but he pays off by carrying forward the, bad, the better levels of thought and action he rewards his parents by disciplining his own children in their own turn so that there is a reciprocity in all these things we pay all debts the debt of birth we pay when we give birth to others everything has an honor system related to it and it is the loss of this honor system that according to the Confucian concept reveals the death of a civilization when virtues fail then there is only one answer and that is a divine intercession of some kind also as we go on further the uh, Chinese code says that we must prepare a livelihood that is suitable to our needs and this livelihood is in no respect different from one level of society to another Confucius said that the idea that some people's jobs are better than other people's jobs is completely unrealistic each individual doing the thing that he can do to the best of his ability is equal in every way to a person of greater talent who is doing larger things in other words the individual who uses his means and his abilities honorably is an honorable person and there are no class divisions of this kind there are only two kinds of people those who are doing it right and those who are not doing it right and those who are doing it right are all on one level regardless whether they are a, a prince or a farmer those who do it wrong are also all on one level whether this wrong is small or large they will ultimately have to pay for it so, so, so Confucius was tr completely socialistic and democratic in his thinking he did not feel that the mandronate or whatever was its equivalent in those days the gentry was privileged to consider itself a better kind of being there is only one kind of betterment and that's self-improvement the individual who knows more and serves better and gives with a greater joy to the needs of others that is the superior person and all who are doing the best they can are superior and have the same values the same recognitions and the same rewards the idea that some honest work is better than another is untrue very often that which is not particularly pleasant is the most important work of all and those who give themselves to it earn a great destiny after they went on a little further then there does come the question as to what to believe well how are we going to judge or believe the world around us or what we might term the God world within us Confucius of course joined with many of the other ancient peoples of the world in a kind of ancestor worship now we consider this completely unreasonable and worthless perhaps because most people have ancestors they don't feel like worshiping <laughs> which is uh, not unusual in these times especially but ancestor worship in China and in many other countries is living up to something not down to it uh, the individual regards his parents as a kind of superior virtue if they've gone forth into the other life they then become symbols of a continuing devotion which is not interfered by with by death the parent becomes an image the parental image of integrity now the moral effect of this is quite interesting and has more values than perhaps we would first believe a, per, a Chinese person who commits an evil action either treason or bri bribery robbery violence or anything of that kind is not really just destroying his own character he is humiliating his ancestors he has failed them they have given him a good life and he has ruined it they have given him the potential of great achievement and he has betrayed them and from somewhere on the other side of life 
these ancestors are sad. They are broken hearted to know that one of their descendants has committed evil. So that this becomes in a sense a strange persuasion against it if you believe that your ancestors can know about it. Now the other side of the coin is also just as difficult. If you have committed an evil act, this disgrace goes on to your children. Your whole family line is deformed. It is betrayed. The, the children have to accept the fact that their parents were not virtuous, that they were the, pro the progeny of an inferior code of life. So the child is humiliated unto the ninth or tenth generation by the crime of this one person. And the ancestors are humiliated back to the beginning of that family. Well, with this moral suasion uh, behind a people who believe in it, you can see why it might have quite an effect upon the integrities of life. It certainly makes the person a little slow uh, to feel that he is disgracing all who have gone before and all who are to come, in addition to disgracing his present family and all those who understand what has happened. So that in ultimately the human being who does a wrong deed is disgracing the entire human family. He has done something unworthy of the tremendous uh, ponderance of value which has been bestowed upon him by nature. He is not fulfilling the rules of rightness and therefore it is a repentance and uh, the Chinese philosophy is very complex on this situation. Uh, atonement is very difficult. Once an evil has been done, the family honor is lost. This is uh, something we don't think about very much. We don't care. Maybe it's superstition. Who knows? But a superstition that makes people honest is perhaps a good substitute for a wisdom that they do not possess. It helps to fill, to fill an, a vacuum with an area of material factors the average person understands. He knows his family, and he knows families of other people. And he has heard of the sorrows that have been caused in this type of thing. And therefore he is uh, more thoughtful. The Japanese have a similar practice. Once a year, they welcome their deceased ancestors back into the world of the living. They go to the riverside, to streams, or to the ocean side, and with little lanterns to escort their invisible ancestors to their home. When they get to the home, a special seat is placed for the ancestors at the banquet for the occasion. Nobody can see them, but everybody feels that they are there as a presence, so that uh, the invisible ancestor has certain requirements. He must understand what has happened to the family since the last meeting. A year ago he was there, and everything was going fairly well, but this time grandmother is sick. This is a very serious factor, and may be something to give, be given very special consideration, because the ancestors deceased are very, very much there in spirit, if not in flesh. Also, the condition of the family. Has there been arguments between family members? Is there something that... It, is there in harmony in the family? Well, if there is in harmony in the family, it's been an unwritten law that it must be arbitrated before the ancestors get there. Because the ancestors must be made happy by knowing that their children and their husbands and their wives and their all the family are living according to good principles. If this is not true, it is a serious disgrace. One other thing, which perhaps has a little more vital significance, is that all ancestors are very unhappy if a family is in debt. That is bad. If people have put off paying their bills, this is a heartbreak for the invisible relatives. Everyone at that time must have become um, solvent. There are cases known in which families have sold family treasures for ridiculously low figures in order that they could pay bills before that important day. 
but the parents must uh, who come visibly or maybe some of them are still alive there must be the respect that the family is out of debt well we'd say these are all superstitions but some superstitions do lead to constructive results and for lack of them and for the lack of anything better a society can fall apart so in the Confucian way also the problem of government is very very interesting the Chinese emperors in the olden days had the annual ceremony of the Temple of Heaven on that day the emperor took off all of his royal regalia and put on the white cloth of a peasant and he walked on a sand that a road that was covered with sand brought in from the desert of Gobi and he made the pilgrimage with nothing but a knotted staff along the way of life until he came to the temple of heaven here in the presence of the gods and of his ancestors and the tablets of the constellations the emperor addressed heaven and he said something to this effect that I am the representative of heaven I have been entrusted to take care of heaven but I have not been worthy I have not done the things that kept my people happy I've not been always fair in my judgments. But if there be trouble, if there be wrong, if there be anything that is not right, let the punishment descend upon me and me alone, for I am the leader of the people. And if they are wrong, it is because I have failed them. Now this is thought on politics. It's a thought that might have interest long after poor old Confucius went to his ancestors namely that leadership has a strange kind of karma the leader is responsible for the security of those he leads when a leader exploits his people before heaven the guilt is upon himself this Confucius was reasonably sure of and of course in those days the Chinese dynasties were falling like ripe carp Avis only a few years and another one took over because everyone in turn became destructive decadent or, or dissipated so Confucius pointed out that wherever problems arise the leader must be held responsible and if he cannot do something about it then he must confess his infirmities he must confess them frankly and honestly and ask the assistance of others to take on the things that he has not been able to accomplish so the great ceremony of the new year was the constant acceptance of the way of heaven so in the Confucius the whole thing sums up in the one great thing the ways of men and these ways may or may not be good but the way of heaven is inevitable the way of heaven is that which most needs attention to know the way of heaven is the end of all learning this is the quest of all scholarship the end of, of, of the way of life is in this Th that we should know the way of heaven is far more important than that we should split an atom we have all kinds of d learnings and researches and scientific corporations and groups exploring this and exploring that but the one thing that we must explore if we are to survive is the way of heaven we must find out what universal law requires and we must keep that which we discover regardless of any consequence to ourselves personally and if we think we have discovered it and are supporting something that is not true and we find that it is not true then it is our need to recognize this and continue our search for the way of heaven Shang Ji the celestial emperor is the source of all good it is the universal principle of life it is that which is alone qualified to lead and all things must follow that leadership now this law this the way of heaven is a way of peace of happiness of securities of kindness and compassion 
The imperial power is compassionate. It is not something forever punishing. It is more anxious to reward. It only, it does not punish anything, but things that break the rules punish themselves because they lose their harmonious relationship with life. The moment we break tr our trust with life, we come into infirmity. And this was what old Confucius taught, and uh, I don't think, right now at least, we're going to be able to get the answer to this out of a computer. We're going to have to get it, not out of instruments, but out of the living instrument in ourselves, the integrity which alone will enable us to do those things which are necessary to the survival of our people. Well, I guess that's all for today.